Hey, welcome to EE585, Ecological Forecasting. In this lecture, I want to talk about scientific workflows and the informatics tools that underlie how we do forecasting and, and bring models and data together. So the synopsis here is that forecasts need to be transparent and accountable, and generally they must be repeated and updated regularly. In keeping with the theme of best practices, this lecture summarizes the informatics of model data fusion by describing tools and practices that make science more transparent, repeatable, and automated. Uh, it's important to note that these tools are not isolated to forecasting. They really should be, become part of all aspects of science, uh, but they are particularly essential uh, to a forecaster as part of our forecasting toolbox because um, you know, very often in forecast, we want to be able to run things repeatedly and we want to have consistent results and we want those results to be transparent. So it's really just, you know, you know, forecasting requires us to raise our game to a new level when it comes to um, scientific workflows. So this kind of re uh, touches on some of the points we had in discussion last week um, that science is needs to be transparent and needs to be reproducible. That reproducibility is itself one of the fundamental tenets of science. You know, what makes science science is that it is reproducible. Analyses are getting more and more sophisticated, though. You know, think about modern, you know, computational workflows and, and high-performance computing and big data. You know, reproducing these analyses, even just basic computational reproduce reproducibility, is getting more and more challenging. And it is true that you know the method section in a paper is rarely, very, very rarely provides enough information to actually know what someone actually did with enough detail to be able to reproduce it. Uh, and on top of that, sometimes we encounter that workflows use tools that are proprietary or unverifiable. So even if we see, we know what someone did, doesn't mean that we can always redo it ourselves because it might require tools that we don't have access to. Uh, as an example, the last point, uh, this is, comes from a paper from Aaron Ellison uh, over a decade ago, where Aaron went through and looked at uh, for a particular class of, of papers, so these were papers on species, richness, productivity relationships, it doesn't matter what it was on, it was just he picked a, a type of analyses and looked through, uh, could those analyses be reproduced at that point in time in the state of the science? And it turned out that, you know, for about half the papers he looked like, looked at, there wasn't sufficient information about what tools were used because they weren't specified with enough detail. And the other half were tools that were specified with enough detail, uh, but it wasn't 100% clear if things were reproducible because the version of the software used then is not the same as the version now, and then you can't guarantee that it's doing the same computation. And this is particularly true with proprietary software where it's, it's much harder to go back to earlier versions. Uh, so there's really, a, on this table, there's only one example of software where the tool was specified with enough information uh, and that tool was still available at the time of this paper, though I will note that I went and checked uh, this software this morning and it that particular tool has been unavailable since 2017. So at this point, 100% of these analyses are no longer reproducible. Um, so Aaron makes has this great quote in this paper that says, repeatability and reproducibility of ecological synthesis requires full disclosure, not only of the hypotheses and predictions, but also of the raw data, methods used to reproduce derived data sets, choices made as to which data or data sets were included and which were excluded, uh, the derived data sets and the tools techniques used to analyze the derived data sets. So basically, you know, reproducibility requires that we have, you know, not just uh, the methods, but also the data uh, and uh, essentially the, the, the tools need to be accessible. Uh, an important concept in the idea of reproducible workflows is this idea of provenance. So provenance is a term kind of borrowed from uh, things like art history, where it th thinks about the chain of custody that something has been in, been through. And so it's in the concept of scientific workflows, it's the chain of custody of our data or of our analysis. So being able to have metadata that documents, you know, the steps that 
uh, a data set went through from raw data to conclusions uh, and recording these pre and post processing steps and any transfer any transformations that were done, interpolations, gap filling, filtering, summarizing, exclusion of data points, visualization, that these are all kind of well documented so that you can get from you know A to Z uh, and there's not you know steps in the middle that we're missing um, that can change the analyses. Uh, about a decade ago, there was a proliferation of tools aimed to try to make this sort of provenance tracking uh, more obvious. So there, there's a class of software called scientific workflow software that literally is, you know, takes your code and breaks it into, you know, boxes and arrows saying, you know, here, you know, here we start with inputs and here are all the steps we do. And the idea was that this was going to control the flow of information. It would be more intuitive than raw code. That these sort of workflows are modular, that they can be reusable, that they should be shareable. And they were, many of them were designed to be heterogeneous in the sense that not every box needed to be using the same software tool. So like maybe one box was being done in R and another box was done, being done in Python and so on. Uh, I'm using a lot of past tense here because the reality is uh, that these sorts of tools never really caught on uh, in ecology. Uh, a lot of folks found them hard to work with. Um, so they still exist. They, they have some advantages, but I also want to point out ways to achieve that sort of uh, workflow control without these sort of graphical workflow tools. Um, so one, one simple tip for improving reproducibility is just having, you know, clear, clearly documented directories. Uh, so instead of having, you know, untitled everything or, you know, version one, version, you know, final, final two, you know, final, I really mean it this time. Uh, having things like, here's an example of a, a workflow uh, documented in, in code up on GitHub, where it's, you know, just by the naming structure within the folder, it's really obvious uh, to someone who's encountering this code for the first time, where to begin in the order that things go in. You know, you start at zero, you, you move through step nine, uh, and you run these things one at a time. And, uh, you know, it, it's a, in many ways, it achieves a degree of self-documenting that this sort of naming convention can be uh, superior to, uh, you know, a readme file that explains those, the, the order you need to run things. And also combining that with, you know, the file names themselves are also uh, informative as to what that step is doing. So in some sense, it's achieving a, an important goal, which is, is to make things as self-documenting as possible. Um, meaningful file names, meaningful order stru structure. Cool, but there's there's a lot more beyond just meaningful file structure. And so I'm gonna, in the next section, we're gonna dive into the some other tools that help us with building reproducible forecast workflows.